Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jody Sanford, and I am the Dean of the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Washington, and really glad that you've joined us for this Dean's Forum that's focusing on data-informed practices in consumer protection and the racialized nature of debt in particular. Um, so we have been running this series uh, for a number of years because I think it's really important for us to continue to focus on the racialized nature of public policy. Um, and the format is that we bring in experts uh, who have different kinds of expertise to talk about that phenomena. We really like the virtual format where you can add questions in the chat and it's really a discussion uh, between me and the panelists. Uh, we have recordings of previous Dean's Forums on our website and they're fairly diverse in terms of topics from managing organizations to child welfare, to health uh, leadership uh, in indigenous communities, post-COVID and Biden, Biden economics. We're going to be recording the event and my team is working behind the scenes to really capture the resources that we'll be discussing today so that people can continue to do a little bit deeper dive into this um, topic. So have your questions, put them in the chat, we'll integrate them in. Um, but before we begin, we'd like to start by acknowledging the land where some of us are uh, living on and sitting from. So here in Seattle, we're uh, living and breathing and being on the land of the Coast Salish people. Um, their ancestors obviously have been here since time immemorial, and they continue to live in this place today, deep, deeply rooted in their cultural traditions. We also like to acknowledge um, that the country was built from this land theft and genocide of indigenous communities and the enslavement and forced labor of black people. And while obviously these acknowledgements are just a small gesture, we like to continue to make them at the beginning of events uh, to have people be mindful of our shared history and um, our real focus on trying to create more just public policy. So we are going to talk today about data informed practices and consumer protection. And my interest in this really, I think, came from when I was in college as a history major, I studied a lot of social justice, progressive history. And back in 1891, uh, there was an advocacy group called the National Consumers League, uh, where they thought we need to do something proactively to intervene in the market. Then 20 years ago, I was working at a foundation uh, in Minnesota where we were seeing the incredible ways that markets were exploiting low-income people, and we started to do investments to help governments and nonprofits catch up and do more in consumer protection. And it was uh, soon thereafter, the federal government stepped in and created the Consumer fin Finance Protection Board. And although that was created in 2010, it continues to be kind of a lightning rod um, of politics. It's very racially charged. And this last summer, there was a call for um, bringing people back in front of Congress and having testimony about the legitimacy of the office. And so for me, it's always interesting, like, why does a value like consumer protection um, cause such grief? <laughs> There's actually, in fact, a con uh, Supreme Court case right now that's looking at, is this office legitimate? And it hinges upon an argument about whether or not it's funded in an appropriate way. The racial dimensions of this policy issue around debt also feels pretty personal to me um, because been with a lot of young people in the last 10 years, I guess, as a mom and seeing how many credit cards and short day payday loans were directed to them, how many really sketchy things for higher ed finance. And this is all happening in the context, obviously, of really very significant racial inequality, very significant income inequality. And so I wanted to really focus on the nature of debt in particular to both prompt people's awareness and have more knowledge because this is a policy domain where it's a little bit confusing because you have these issues about credit and debt and marginal lending action. And we all go into debt for education, mortgage and credit cards. Then you have this body of work that's around legal action if people aren't fulfilling and paying on their debt. And then on the far end, this kind of worry about bankruptcy. Um, and so I really wanted to bring together some experts who could help us think about this and really be able to be more aware ourselves about the way that racialized systems 
um, are driving some of what's happening and yet are a little bit invisible. So I uh, went around the country and found some experts to help us understand this this issue. Um, and I'd like to introduce them now. Uh, so Raf uh, Sharon Chaimie is an associate professor at Arizona State University, and his research focuses on racial inequality in households, uh, particularly the experience with credit and consumer markets. And he focuses on the role of these experiences in the reproduction of the gap in racial wealth. Dalier Jimenez uh, is the director of student loan and law and a professor at the UC Irvine School of Law. She was founding staff actually at that federal agency I was referencing, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, so has perhaps some insights into that. And she's also a member of the American Bankruptcy Institute's Commission on Consumer Bankruptcy. And also for our use, I think, as she's a member of a cool initiative uh, called the Debt Collection Lab. And then Claire, last but not least, Claire Johnson Raba uh, is a former legal aid attorney, and she's an assistant professor of law at Illinois Chicago Law School. And she really focused on government imposed debt and how does the government itself get involved in this debt collection, consumer bankruptcy, and credit reporting. So when we talked about it, we thought that Raf might do an overview to kind of get some of us to get some basic understanding of these topics, the phenomena and the challenge that we're seeing in the information about how this current system is impacting people by race. And then Dalia and Claire, we're going to start to dig into um, what do we know about that consequence on people and then flow from there. So without further ado, wrap. Thank you. Uh, so yes, I'm Raf Shadal Shindy. I'm an associate professor um, of sociology at Arizona State University, and I am by no means a policy person, uh, but as a sociologist, I do a lot of work on the context um, of that, and that's um, that's what I wanted to talk about as a, uh, a way to get the conversation started. Um, so I think the, the thing I really want to highlight, and the thing that I think is really um, important to keep at the forefront of discussions of debt is that over the last, you know, maybe 50 to 60 years, um, supporting household borrowing and supporting household use of credit has come to be really one of the, the, the main ways that the sort of American welfare state uh, uses to meet social welfare goals. Um, and that is something that's given rise to a, a fairly regressive system of, of social provision. Uh, that exposes a lot of families, um, and especially families of color, to um, financial risk um, and ultimately to wealth extraction. Um, so I have a few slides. I'm not sure if participants can see them. Uh, I cannot on my end. I could also share them directly if that's easier. Thank you. So yeah, so I, we can just keep the first slide for now. So um, so yeah, so that context, I think what what that that sort of uh, highlights is that debt has a, a bit of a dual relationship to inequality, where on the one hand, not having access to credit uh, is really a major problem. And it means that households sort of lose the opportunity to pursue uh, important goals like social mobility or, or building uh, uh, sort of private safety nets. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, taking on debt also means that households become a lot more vulnerable. And, and it means that a lot of the household's uh, resources end up um, um, end up, you know, resources that could have been used on other things end up going to uh, financial providers. And so I, I think that overall, it's sort of really important to think about that in that uh, sort of political economy context as a as a as a really core element of contemporary forms of racial capitalism, um, and something that's a, a major driver uh, of contemporary uh, racial inequality. Um, and the slide I have. I have up here is, um, uh, if you want to read more about the sort of context, um, there's a, a really great article by Abby Atkinson, who's a legal scholar uh, at Berkeley that I think really gives uh, a really great overview uh, of the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Uh, so given that sort of background, what I wanted to do as an introduction is just show a couple of estimates uh, of household debt. Uh, the first thing I wanted to mention, um, and I don't, I don't have a slide for that one, uh, um, is that you know, typically, if you look at debt levels for households across income or across assets or across education, across different measures of the social class, what you'll generally see across data sets is that households in the most privileged uh, social positions actually tend to hold the most debt. Um, and they often do so by a, a really large margin. And that's something that, you know, can be a bit 
counterintuitive, but I think it really highlights uh, the way that debt is used as a resource to make you know, a, a variety of social welfare investments. Um, so when we look at, at patterns of debt um, by race and ethnicity, which I'm, I'm showing here, that's the kind of pattern that emerges. Um, if you look back to sort of the late 80s, um, and this is data from the Survey of Consumer Finances, by the way, um, you can see that median household debt has really been going up for all households uh, by quite a bit. But over the entire period, you, you see that white households always tend to have more debt than households of color, um, and that the, the racial and ethnic gaps in debt holding um, in general have been uh, sort of increasing over time. If we could go to the next slide. Um, so here I'm showing a couple of other estimates. Um, the, the research on these debt patterns, though, suggests that this is really not something that reflects better financial health for Black and Latino households, but it is actually driven primarily by uh, various forms of financial inclusion, uh, exclusion. Sorry. Um, historically, we see that Black and, and Latino households have not had the same access to lending. Um, and there's various indicators of that that I'm showing here. Um, and, and it's meant not having the same opportunities to invest in sort of those welfare increasing assets like, like uh, own housing or educational credentials. Um, another consequence has been that uh, Black and Latino households have also been much more dependent on forms of predatory inclusion, um, like, like payday lending, um, where you can see that you know, black households are almost three times more likely than white households to use uh, payday lending in a given year, and to, and to other forms of, of sort of subprime um, uh, lending that tends to offer um, extremely harmful products. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, one of the consequences of that is that, so even though as I showed, black and Latino households tend to hold a lot less debt, um, they tend to be either just as burdened or to be more burdened by those lower levels of debt uh, compared to white households that are in similar class positions. And you can see here the pattern is, is uh, especially stark at middle income levels. Um, and I think that helps highlight just how um, financially fragile um, uh, middle and even higher income Black and Latino households are uh, because of debt relative to um, to white households. Oh, and I didn't mention this. What I'm showing is the a, a debt to asset ratio. So it's how much debt households hold on average compared to how much assets they have. And that's a typical measure of, um, of just how burdensome the debt is for households. Um, and the last thing I wanted to show is a couple of other indicators uh, of, of a similar uh, similar patterns. Like we see that if you look at other types of indicators of, um, of, of debt burden, um, you see these same types of racial disparities, right? So monthly death payments um, per amount borrowed tend to be higher um, for Black households compared to, uh, well, compared to both Latino and white households. Um, you see that, that households of color tend to struggle a lot more with making debt payments, even though amounts borrowed tend to be lower. And you see that bankruptcy rates, um, even though they, they tend to be low uh, overall, um, are higher for Black um, and Latino households than for white households. And so overall, what these trends point to, I think, is a, is a really marked racialization of households' ability to use debt to make welfare investments, um, a, a marked disparity in uh, having to rely on sort of alternative and often very harmful credit products to, to make up for the, the differences in access in a situation where the consequences of borrowing um, end up being much worse for, on average, for, for households of color uh, than for white households. And so I think that uh, uh, given that context, uh, well, first, it would obviously be great to uh, provide for people's welfare through other means that don't rely on debt, uh, sort of more uh, socially democratic forms of uh, public provision. But in the absence of that, I think it's it's really crucial to think about um, how how the you know, policies that can protect borrowers um, against abuse and and uh, and predatory practices, and especially um, policies that specifically target practices that harm borrowers of color. Um, and uh, yeah, I I think that's sort of what I wanted to provide. So I'm happy to turn it over to uh, I think Dalia is next. Well, and let me just do the transition. I think Raf, because I 
One of the things for me about this topic is that people experience it individually in their own families, right? And as you say, it is in part an outcome of a other set of policy decisions that have been made in the United States around social welfare provision. And I think um, what I wanted Dahlia to bring to our conversation is just kind of this user journey <laughs> of like, how do you get into that place where you by yourself are feeling more and more anxious about debt and late payments and all of that. So Dahlia, help us yeah. helps create some comments. I'm happy to do that. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here and um, always love talking about this stuff and getting, getting um, becoming aware of it. But I also love that Ralph started with Abby's um, article because she's a former classmate of mine um, and uh, and friend. And the, and the point, your last point, Ralph, I just want to start with that of, you know, the, the thing to do policy wise, um, I think, and, uh, you know, is to actually provide for people um, in a straightforward way, as in give them money um, and, you know, ensure that they have some kind of basic needs met. Um, the alternative or like what we've been working on, you know, when we did some of that during COVID and there's some, you know, really good evidence that that actually was actually helpful as one might expect. Um, the alternative of, you know, helping um, uh, sort of on the back end once people are in debt and have um, problems like, you know, with uh, laws and regulations is very imperfect. And so I'll explain a little bit why. So um, so I, uh, I, I studied you know, people in debt and bankruptcy, and I teach bankruptcy as well. And bankruptcy is sort of the end of for many people, but not all. In fact, um, a, you know, less than a million people file bankruptcy any given year, but people struggling with debt, um, you know, is, is far uh, greater than that. Something like 50 million people um, have a debt in collections um, at any given time. So, um, when people can't pay their debts, they often can't pay several ones, right? Like it's not just um, that they're having, uh, they're, they're usually struggling, you know, kind of juggling and ultimately it all kind of comes to a head. And in many of those circumstances, um, they end up getting sued. And um, they end up getting sued in a state court and um, they get a notice, you know, and this all varies 50 states as well as even within states, um, some of the forms and kinds of notices can vary. But they get sued and um, and noticed to either go to court or they have to file paperwork. Um, uh, and if they don't uh, follow procedure, which is actually I've I've looked deeply at the procedure of several states and you know more gener gener generically at others, it is not easy procedure even for lawyers. Um, so let alone a person who's already overwhelmed with debt. Um, if they can't follow the procedure, uh, then they will have a default judgment entered against them, which means that basically the creditor or the debt buyer, the person who purchased the debt from the credit card company or the payday lender um, or um, the university or whatever it is, they will end up um, uh, getting a judgment from the court saying that this person owes them money while the person has not had a chance to actually say anything um, about whether or not they owe money or, um, you know, whether they can pay it or anything like that. There generally then becomes a um, a, 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 a time for the creditor, an opportunity for the creditor rather in court to ask um, the um, for information from the debtor, from the person, you know, who um, who just lost a lawsuit about like their assets and their income to try to figure out where to get money from. And that, um, which is called debtor's examinations in many states, is um, the place where people actually can end up going to jail over a civil debt. Um, because if they fail to show up to that in many states, not all, um, they can have a, a, a warrant issued out for their arrest. And sometimes, you know, if they're picked up for something else or a police officer talks to them, runs, you know, it's not like usually, usually that somebody goes looking for them, but the warrant is out there outstanding. And if the person encounters any kind of law enforcement, um, then they will likely be jailed for not having shown up to that hearing. Um, in that hearing, if they do show up, then in theory, um, you know, the court is supposed to determine whether or not the person has anything, whether they're basically like not willing to pay um, and as opposed to not being able to pay. Um, and uh, and if there's assets like a car that may not be exempt um, by their state law so that it could be um, seized and sold and then the proceeds can be used to pay the debt. 
Um, that's not really what ends up happening at any of the hearings that I've been to. Of course, I haven't been to, but like what ends up, you know, that their debtors in many states have a lot of protection by the law of things like, yeah, you can't seize the car in many states um, because there's a really high um, exemption amount, like the, the debtor can keep a lot of the car. And most debtors don't really own a lot. So there really isn't a lot of, you know, things to seize there. Throughout all of this procedure, the debt collector, of course, is talking to the debtor and has this sort of like, you're going to have to go to court, you're going to have to do all of this. So they're most often, uh, you know, cajoling the debtor into paying something, entering some kind of payment plan, even if they cannot afford it. And debt collectors and debt buyers have told me that, you know, like, you know, there was this 90 year old grandma and she couldn't pay. And, you know, she, in fact, you know, everything from the description, like she didn't have to pay in the sense that nothing that she owned could be seized or sold or obtained by the creditor, but she agreed to pay $10 a month. Um, and, you know, she was, you know, that that was like a success from both ends, but I mean, not in my mind, but um, in the sense that like, she probably really could use those $10 a month for something else. Um, but so all of this is this sort of state court procedure. At any point, a person can stop this, um, and file bankruptcy and the state court procedure kind of, you know, will disappear for most debts. There are a few debts, civil, um, uh, sorry, criminal debts and um, uh, some civil debts like taxes and uh, student debts in many cases uh, where that it won't erase those debts, but it will at least stop any kind of lawsuit going on or even the um, uh, arrest um, or something like that. And then the debts can be erased. So bankruptcy can be a huge um, solution to people in, you know, in, in these situations. In theory, in practice, of course, there are problems in that um, the system, the bankruptcy system is fairly inaccessible to many people, both because of the talk about procedure, hundreds of pages, literal hundreds of pages of forms that need to be filed um, in order to get a bankruptcy. So most people seek an attorney. There are there is actually a fairly um, vibrant market for uh, consumer debtor and attorneys, um, but they are expensive on average across the country. Two thousand dollars. The fees are around three hundred dollars. So again, you're someone who can't pay the majority of you know, and and yet you're supposed to come up with this money, um, and and then even. Uh, outside of that, some many debts cannot be discharged in bankruptcy. So I'm not, I shouldn't say that. Not many. Several important debts cannot be discharged in bankruptcy, like recent taxes and um, the criminal fees, which obviously um, impact people of color differently because of the racialized nature of, you know, criminal justice and how, um, you know, policing. And so those are actually, those can be a significant portion of many people's, you know, like what, what really is um, bogging them down. And yet they cannot be, they basically pass through unaffected um, through the bankruptcy. Um, and student debt, which I also study, uh, could be potentially discharged, but, um, and that is changing the, the Department of Education and the Department of Justice um, have changed the procedures right now um, as of a year and November 2022. Um, they changed the procedures and actually um, there's now a form where they basically ask people very basic uh, information. Like it should not be very burdensome information to provide. And they are, um, I'm actually digging into those records right now. They are actually uh, forgiving more debt than they used to be. Um, but it is still, again, that form is several pages. It is, you know, uh, I, I tried to get it to make to make it simpler. Um, it's it's as simple as they could make it. Um, so all of this means then that we have, you know, that that people, it, there are options, there are ways to get out of, um, you know, some of these um, problems, but they're very imperfect. Um, and uh, in the case of bankruptcy, for example, even if you do succeed, even if your debts are discharged, um, because of what Raf explained about like how we don't support people, um, we don't have a, our welfare state uses bankruptcy as a form of welfare, um, you know, uh, um, safety net. Uh, because of that, it is likely that people will end up back in the same situation because ultimately the whole idea of debt for people of color in particular, but you know, anyone uh, who um, whose family doesn't have a lot of wealth um, is, you know, to try to use it to either survive or, um, or improve, right? Like, you know, you just, and, and in many of these cases, um, even if you have a 0%, and this is Abby's paper, 
um, you know, uh, even if you have a 0% interest loan, like there's just no fees, no anything. The fact is you're borrowing money that you don't have today. And so in order to pay back that money, your situation has to improve in the future for you to be able to like actually be able to pay back money that you don't have today. And yet what we know about income growth and, you know, uh, labor markets is that that is not the case for most people in this country and has not been for many decades. And so there, in general, this is just a losing proposition for, again, people in the socioeconomic and racial groups that we're talking about. Um, so maybe that, I, I think, Jody, that maybe went to what you wanted. <laughs> like, if not, I can fill in later. No, it's great. And I want to have Claire's voice too here soon, because I think part of what you're helping to make visible is, again, people experience this one by one by one. But when you look at it at the aggregate, there are some real patterns that are are part of how the system operates. And I think, Claire, from your experience in those courts, you have a lot of a lot of insight onto that. So bring your expertise into the conversation as well. And thanks so much for having me here, Jody. This is a wonderful group to be at, be among, and I'm so excited to talk to policy advocates and, and people who study policy. Um, so I'm a former legal aid attorney. I ran a consumer law practice at a large legal aid program for 10 years. And for po folks that don't know, right, um, you're entitled to an attorney if you can't afford one in criminal proceedings if your liberty is at stake. But you're not entitled to an attorney in civil proceedings, and that includes debt collection and most civil proceedings. Um, and so that includes debt collection. And so as a legal aid practitioner, we did representation for some individuals sued on debt collection, but there are so many more lawsuits filed that we didn't have the capacity to serve everyone. And so a lot of what I study when I joined academia, what I began to study when I joined academia, is what is the role that the court plays in the debt collection practice, right? How do the debt collectors use um, the business practices of debt collection in the courts to obtain judgments, to collect on those judgments? And really, what does it mean from a structural standpoint that we've got a system that is a public service, but it is really only serving one side of the litigation? When we think about litigation, we think about a dispute between two parties and two parties who go before a neutral body, a judge, and present their, their two sides of the case and that we get a fair outcome. But that's our data that we're studying shows us that that's not what happens in debt collection lawsuits, right? So Dalia and I are both um, co-principal investigators with a project called the Debt Collection Lab at Princeton University which is an interdisciplinary project. We've got uh, sociologists, a um, whole bunch of, uh, we've got data scientists, we've got a whole bunch of other folks involved in this project. Um, and the goal of the Debt Collection Lab is uh, bringing um, debt, dignity to debt. We're trying to change the narrative about debt collection, um, letting folks out there who are, who are dealing with debt collection know they're not alone, but also driving interest in studying and empirical research around debt collection, because a lot of this stays hidden. Things that happen in state courts stay hidden and invisible. Um, and so our findings show, you know, that fewer than 10% of debt collection actions in California have a consumer defendant that engages at all at any point in the case, right? And so we're studying some of these things that Dalia mentioned, like what is the role that the debt collector, play, debt collector plays in dissuading people from going to court, but also what is the role that the complexity and the administrative burden of the courts, what role does that play in discouraging participation? Um, so I'm gonna talk just a little bit about what the data itself shows us in courts, um, in state courts. Um, so the Debt Collection Lab, we have a debt collection tracker on the website where you can select um, on, on uh, debtcollectionlab.org, you can select the debt collection tracker and under each county, you can look at an interactive map of, um, of the different uh, parameters and the demographics of a, of a county. And there's a chart that shows the difference in proportionality to the demographic distributions and norms within a county um, and how disproportionately debt collection lawsuits are filed against people of color. Um, so we see this in a number of different instances and researchers have been studying and doing a deep dive into a number of states. 
just this last year, reports came out studying Minnesota, Michigan, um, and I published a piece on the Debt Collection Lab on disparate impact in debt collection cases in California. Um, all three of these reports collect data from the courts, which is difficult to come by because state court data is disaggregated. It usually is county by county. So there's a fair amount of work that must be done to clean and normalize this data. Um, but at the Debt Collection Lab, we're trying to bring all of this data into one place uh, and create data standards so we can help to do apples to apples comparisons and so we could do things like evaluate if changes in a particular state work from a policy standpoint, how might we replicate that in other states, right? So um, as an example, some of the work that was done here in um, Michigan looked at the disproportionate number of filings in predominantly Black neighborhoods. This was work that was done at the census tract level and looking at that across income levels, um, just uh, predominantly Black neighborhoods have a much higher rate of lawsuit filings, right? Um, Minnesota also shows the same thing. So across all income levels, African-American and Hispanic Latino borrowers or predominantly African-American or Hispanic Latino neighborhoods show a much higher rate of filing. So like this is not a, you know necessarily a causal relationship. A lot of the upstream factors that Raf and Dalia talked about um, likely go into this, right? Subprime lending targeted at communities of color, um, using credit to make ends meet because of the racial wealth gap, um, and that folks don't have don't use that folks of color don't necessarily use credit in the same way um, that wealthier well folks in wealthier neighborhoods might do. Um, but this does show, right, that the people who are suffering and having to go to court and being hailed into court to defend on a debt are disproportionately people of color. So when we think about policy changes, both from like the lending and origination side, but also to help people who are struggling, who haven't been able to make ends meet, and then who are sued, we're talking about disproportionately communities of color who are not receiving services, who are not receiving help, who are not able to defend themselves in court, right? So in California, one of the interesting things about California is we actually did um, a predicted race of the individual debtors. So rather than the census tract analysis, and California is, is has a higher rate of Hispanic, Latino, population, but we saw a much higher disproportionate burden on this population of debt collection lawsuits. We also saw that Black and Hispanic borrowers filed answers, which means they participated in the lawsuits at far lower rates than white and Asian American borrowers. We also saw much lower rates of attorney representation among those communities, uh, uh, um, historically disadvantaged communities of color. So the data in courts can show us lots of interesting things. And we and we at the Debt Collection Lab are starting to gather this from a lot of different jurisdictions. Um, and we're also interviewing affected individuals, legal aid personnel, and things like that across the country in order to get a better, better handle and a better understanding of how individuals experience debt collection in the courts. Um, in order to drive policy change, legislative change, court rules change, and understand how that can be made more a fair process rather than really the one-sided arm of the debt collectors that it currently is. Um, and that's been characterized as, you know, the the racial wealth, how the courts are part of racial wealth extraction, right? If we're talking about racial wealth extraction um, through predatory lending, and the court plays a role in that by basically icing out one side of, of the litigation and not allowing them or not making it easy for them to raise defenses, then the court is engaged in, um, in facilitating that racialized wealth extraction. So um, thank you so much, you guys, for getting all of this out on the table for us to now dive into a little bit more. Uh, point of clarification, one of the uh, viewers asked a question about in in all of the data that's been presented, there's not much about American Indian and indigenous communities. And so just if somebody, maybe the demographer can say a little bit more about why that's true, Ralph. Uh, sure. I mean, the 
Um, so there's a methodological question and then a substantive question. Um, it part of the issue is that um, in national data sets, uh, there, there's typically not uh, large samples of indigenous people, um, and that means that it's difficult to do research with sort of the, the publicly available um, uh, sort of nationally produced uh, data sets, which is absolutely something that could be changed, right? Like the, the, the national samples could make an effort to oversample specific populations, particularly get more information from um, indigenous communities around the United States so that we can have those uh, easily reliable estimates. So it's not like the methodological issue is unsurmountable. It's just an issue of uh, oversampling certain folks, but right now that that's not typically being done as a matter of course, and so um, it, it's difficult to uh, to get comparable estimates. Um, in terms of the substantive question, though, I I think um, from like from the little I've seen, the 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 issues that folks in indigenous communities face are are fairly similar, uh, very different, uh, and and much more restricted access. I'm sorry, access to debt. Um, and and disproportional targeting by uh, sort of predatory uh, providers um, here in Arizona, like you, you can um, see a sort of you know growth of sort of predatory sort of car lending, check cashing, like financial institutions at at sort of the edges of different um, uh, reservations, right? Because they're not allowed in the actual uh, national territory, but um, you see those kind of services crop up. In, in similar ways that you see them um, in racially segregated neighborhoods. And so I think the, the like it's an extremely important issue and I would expect to see very similar racialization processes, um, but the, the data that's routinely available to look at these things does not provide the capacity for, for producing uh, that kind of estimate. Dali, I see you put a reference to an urban institute study that took one take on that too. So we'll make that available to people uh, in the record too, in addition to your link. So um, when you guys are laying out the nature of the problem, it, it's really, really complicated, right? Because on the one hand, Claire and Dali are talking about what happens in court, one by one by one by one people. And you begin to think, oh, there's something larger here happening. There's also the way the markets and the dynamics are set up. And so one of the things I wanted to ask is, how does consumer protection policy, the federal efforts, the state efforts to try and make it so that people are less likely to go through that pathway that Dalia is talking about of, you know, having a situation where you can't pay on debt and then you are getting that there is examination and then you're going down that path. Like, what are the ways in which um, the government has been successful in trying to um, address the way the markets are set up and where has it really been failing? Um, I guess I could take some, I start to take some of that question. So um, at many levels, especially post, you know, 2007, seven eight, there was a renewed, right? Like in, in 2010, the CFPB being formed, um, uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, as you mentioned, Jody, um, there was a renewed interest in in sort of, you know, and, and efforts and, um, and resources, uh, you know, on all of these issues. And so some of it has taken the form of lawsuits um, by regulators. Um, in the debt collection context, um, you know, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase couldn't sue for a number of years um, uh, in debt collection courts because um, they entered into a consent decree with the Office of Control of the Currency and the CFPB and several other regulators, um, I think even some attorneys generals, uh, about the kind of documentation that they were not bringing to court that they didn't have. Um, and um, where they weren't very clear, it wasn't clear from their records that they knew how much money people really owed them um, and uh, and who exactly was it, you know, were they suing the right people. Uh, similar consent decrees were issued against the other two largest public companies um, who uh, who sue, who purchased debts from Bank of America and Chase and others, um, uh, uh, Portfolio uh, Recovery Associates and Midland Funding. Um, and they kind of slowed down and fixed some of their problems. And, and as, far, as far as we're seeing in the data, pretty quickly caught back on. Um, I, you know, 
that helps in some respects the chase uh decree i think also include included like forgiving some debts and and there have been sort of smaller ones that also included those kind of things uh i mean i think this would be the newest tally is something like was it 17 um billion dollars i'm going to say it wrong maybe i'll look it up afterwards that the cfpb has returned not just in debt collection issues but in you know ir- illegal activities um you know to consumers illegal activities that, that they have um you know sued people about uh, so there's there's sort of there's that aspect of it. Then um, there was in the mid 2010s, there were uh, reform movements in uh, several states uh, trying to change the kind of documents and information that a creditor would have to um, bring to state court in order to receive a judgment. Because as I mentioned, if the person never shows up and as Claire mentioned, the traditional like way that the procedure works in um, you know, most state courts is, uh, well, you're not here to tell us anything. We're only hearing one side. And since you're not here to dispute it, and then we just leave that side and, um, and they win and they win for uh, the amount that they're saying. And um, when we were particularly worried about, you know, some of these debts, including from one of the largest banks in the country being actually not correct um, and, you know, the information being wrong, um, and the fact that, you know, I didn't talk about it, but like, you know, I can drop in a link to an article describing how these debts are sold, how the information is sold, how it's so easy for it to get messed up, like in terms of the numbers being wrong or, you know, uh, information being dropped or um, mingled, uh, you know, between people and just it not being um, verifiable. Uh, then uh, courts and uh, at the state court levels and at the state legislatures began to pass laws um, requiring additional documents and additional information uh, be attached to um, the complaints and to or and or to the moment um, when the creditor gets their judgment from the court, which, you know, that judgment can then turn into, you know, getting a car or a home or all sorts of things. And one part I forgot to mention earlier can follow in many states can follow people forever um, because it can be renewed again and again. Um, and so if at any time the person ever gets any money, you know, um, then, uh, you know, the the creditor can follow them in that way. So um, so those two have been I and mean, we're actually Claire and I are currently studying with um, some economists. The effect of those laws are preliminary, very preliminary findings so far is not a lot of effect. Um, not surprising because there was the hope of the laws and the idea of the law and then the actual law in most cases turned out to be a watered down version of like what people were hoping for. Um, and so there's possible, it's, you know, we're, we're still digging in, but, um, but we have a deadline of a few months. And so and this will be posted in the debt collection lab. So you can go look um, in July, probably, um, or definitely because it's a grant, we have to do it. Um, we'll have it there. Uh, but, you know, those have been the major sort of the major reforms, I think. Um, and they've done something, but, um, my, you know, I mean, while I work on all these kind of reforms uh, and, uh, you know, in, in these cases and in, in, in other cases, I feel like, you know, at some point, really, it's, it's this is all so much work um, that would be, uh, you know, we could do so much better if we started earlier, if we started with people not having these debts um, in the first place. I want to get talk- to that. Well, right, I want to get back to that, but I think I want Claire to answer some of this question, too. Yeah. So I actually just dropped a note in the chat in response to a question. And um, so I think one of the things that the court <laughs> one of the other things that the court record data can show us is the prevalence of particular plaintiffs. Um, and so we're able to aggregate plaintiffs by by creditor type. Um, and we're able to look at things like TD Bank, which issues the target red card, and look at subprime auto lenders in, in various communities, such as the data we've looked at in, in Texas, in the Houston area, and in California. Um, and when we do see in the California data that um, these subprime products are suing communities of color more frequently, and um, that that presents an opportunity for study to look at, you know, sort of what's going on in the origination and the marketing of these credit products, particularly very low limit credit cards with high interest rates, um, and sort of what is the likelihood or what is the what is the business model about default on the part of the lender and the creditor, right? And so we, we also need to ask ourselves, we know that subprime auto loans are often, there's a churn at buy here, pay here lots for used cars, where the car is sold to someone and then it is repossessed 
and then it is sold again. And if your car is repossessed and you still owe a balance on the loan that's worth more than the car, you will be sued in most states for the deficiency balance, which is the difference between the value of the car and what you owe on the loan, which is likely more. And so we see that showing up in the data as well. So there's also like a connection and opportunity to explore what's going on with, you know, the sale of goods as well as and, and secured loans on the sale of goods in the in the subprime auto lending space. So I'll just say that there's um there are other very interesting things that come out of this data that present additional research questions on the origination side. Yeah, and and Claire, on that, the study you're talking about with the subprime credit cards. So you're saying that they're targeting communities of color more irregardless of income irregardless of other kinds of demographics, or is that not controlled for in the model? I'm maybe getting too technical. So we haven't done the research about the target, the origin. I mean, there, the CFPB has done a tremendous amount of research um, and has come out with a number of reports about target, about how um, subprime auto loans target communities of color um, and and, mm -hmm. and subprime, you know, non non housing loans are also targeted at communities of color. Um, we have not connected these two pieces of data yet, but because we're just finding this information in the debt collection data, but it presents an opportunity to to connect the two sets of data and, and do some additional research and to control for things like that for income levels and things like that. It's awesome. I mean, not awesome, but it's awesome that people are beginning to see the patterns, right? Um, so Dahlia said some things about um, earlier, right? Not getting in a situation where debt isn't such a burden, which I think goes back to exactly where Ross started, which is part of what's happening is that these products are being used by people because of really... Um, you know, inadequate social welfare safety provision. But are there other things we need to grapple with with that? And then I'm going to start getting a little bit more into some of the things, ways to to deal with this situation we find ourselves in. Yeah, I, I, this is not, I mean, it's, it's related to what you're asking, but also sort of continuing on the earlier conversation about the things that seem like they're effective. And I, I do not do sort of policy work at that level of detail, but um, in sort of the, the work that I've done on, on on sort of looking at the broader predictors of particularly the use of, of predatory loans, like um, payday lending and that kind of stuff that will end up, that that, that folks will end up in that kind of, of situation. Um, the, the, the things, and this is more in line with your, with, your, with your question, the things that are like strong predictors of whether folks actually use um, predatory lending um, ends up being, um, obviously, income levels is important, um, having, um, um, you know, stuff like financial literacy ends up not mattering much. Um, most of the evidence tends to suggest that folks who use predatory products are well aware that the products are predatory. Um, if you ask them to make a guess as to the likelihood of defaulting on the, the product, they make very accurate guesses about uh, the likelihood of defaulting, and they make very accurate guesses about like what's that what that is going to cost them um, in the end. And so th th that's not the kind of stuff that seems to matter more. The, the kind of broad things that seem to matter more is whether households have access to traditional credit products, uh, not having a credit card, and not having um, someone in your social network that could provide you like a, a, a loan that doesn't go through a bank, basically, um, are very strong predictors of not just pay to lending use and in particular, but of the racial gaps um, in, in paid and ending. And at sort of a broader level, um, generosity of sort of local welfare uh, provision, like uh, I've read a paper recently looking at um, unemployment insurance, um, temporary assistance to needy families and variation on how generous it is across counties and that kind of stuff. And in general, more generous programs uh, lead to much lower rates of, of um, sort of predatory um, uh, financial institutions locating in a place so like i i think that's part of it like where we're, we're catching people earlier as you were mentioning is that when there's those support or where there is more robust access to to less predatory products um that people don't go through the pipeline at the same um uh, in the same way and will not end up in in debt collection and, and that kind of thing so i think you keep on saying you're not a policy person but there are important policy things to what you just said which is for many years, we spent a lot of money investing in financial literacy programs, right? And trying to say, oh, look, sometimes that happens to me. 
Um, You're on a Mac, aren't you? I, know, right? <laughs> I, I am yeah. on a Mac. <laughs> um, anyway, that financial literacy programs would be a way to deal with this problem. And I think you're right. The evidence has shown that that's not true. And states have to catch up in laying down those financial literacy programs. Um, I also wonder when you all are talking about what's happening in the courts, if it feels like you are watching the consequences of social welfare systems and social welfare policies that are not working. Like, do you feel like that's what you're seeing in the courtrooms? Well, I, I will mean, say that, go ahead, Dahlia. No, no, go. So, I mean, there there is a fair amount of, there's a body of research in the legal academy around studying unrepresented people who do appear in court. And I'll like Anna Carpenter and Colleen Shanahan and Alex Smart have studied, um, you know, there's a whole, group of, uh, of papers that they've written. One of them is judges and lawyerless courts, looking at sort of how self-represented litigants are treated um, by judges when they appear in court and sort of how disempowering that is and how little discretion judges have to really listen or, um, or, or be flexible with the rules of evidence to allow, for example, somebody to come up and show on their phone, pick their phone screen, you know, a picture that is evidence of domestic violence or mold in their apartment. Um, and so those have been studied in the in the eviction context, um, in the protective order context. But debt collection is is quite different in that, you know, the rates of response by consumer defendants in the states where we've studied this is it's extraordinarily low. Right. And we've looked most closely at this in California. And the rate of response is just incredibly low. And the default rate in other states is also reflects this. Right. These cases move to judgment without the engagement of the consumer defendant. So I think when we ask what are the experience of his experiences of a consumer defendant in court, we're not really asking the right question because most frequently they don't make their way to court. It's like what is what is the role what is the role that the court plays in either leading to that default judgment which can which can lead to a bank levy, a garnishment of wages, the placement of a lien on real property, right? I mean these are real and severe consequences that are long lasting. Um and then what does it mean, you know, to have a system that that really is not engaged at all by one side. Um so I th I think it's a different question, right? Self-represented litigants appear in court and represent themselves. Um folks who don't respond or 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 engage at all are also tracked as unrepresented, um, but they also don't file an answer or appear in court. Delia, anything you would add on that? I have another question from the audience. No, I think she. So one of the questions that came from somebody who works at the Department of Commerce is, you know, at the state level, are do you, any of you have recommendations about ways that state government can change the, this kind of process uh, that we've talked about intentionally, um, particularly working with in partnership with nonprofits that serve historically underrepresented groups or you know businesses that are working in in particular communities? What could what could be done? Or I know you've been doing some work in California. I don't know if that would help. So if I, I want, I don't know if maybe I misunderstood the question, but because I, I, the, I understood it to be about helping nonprofit and businesses, BIPOC, you know, black, indigenous people of color, et cetera, um, uh, helping uh, them with their debt issues. Um, and that's so the, the Jeremy Walker who like, you know who put that question if, if that's not what I'm if that's a, I wanted to answer that question I guess that's what I thought the question was which was which is um, uh, so the answer is to me is that there are a lot of um, laws and rules and regulations um, yes exactly getting loans is a problem they go into debt to serve their community um, and the there are many predatory loans that are used in these particular um, circumstances uh, that are, you know, that are made available to, it's it's not just to, to you know, nonprofits or business of color, but to small business owners. Um, and of course, they're going to be disproportionately, uh, you know, uh, the smaller business owners are going to be disproportionately of color. And um, those products are um, very similar to the products that are available for a regular, you know, for a consumer 
Um, but if they're but if they're used by a, and, and then these business owners are often just like so you know practitioner you know they're just by themselves they're really not even like you know it's themselves not the entity and there is no entity or even if there is it's really them that are the entity um, and if they were uh, taking a consumer product it would be subject to um, a number of protections laws state and federal when you uh, take that same product for a business a lot of those protections go away. The CFPB is no longer your regulator of those. In fact, there is no regulator of those protections. And yet, at the, yeah. And yet, what we have is basically, you know, a person who has their own personal things. They take a credit card for business. I mean, I like I do consulting, right? And so I get credit card offers for business all the time. And like, they're it, it makes no sense. Um, and people are getting this, you know, uh, you know, even if they have. Like if they have any, if in any little, you know, a mail list, they show up as potentially like starting a business. And once they get that credit card, that credit, that credit card does not, is not subject to the um, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. So debt collectors don't have to follow all those rules. Um, it's not subject to, um, you know, CFPB oversight and all of that. So I, I think one of the things that could be changed is that when we're talking about essentially a person, even if it's for business purpose, but the business purpose is very much a you know, business out of my house kind of thing or a small um, kind of thing, uh, that those laws could apply in that context. Hmm. Hmm. I can't believe that we are almost done with the hour. Um, for the audience, we've been gathering the resources that have been in the chat, but then there have been some back chats too of other kinds of documentation around um, some of the comments about financial literacy and other things. So we'll be sending that out um, to the participants as a resource bucket. I guess I would just ask each of you to kind of, you know, little finite things about what you hope policy and systems level people understand about this problem or their solution. What's your final, what, what's your final word for this conversation? Something real and quick. I should and say, Oh, There'll be more ahead. time for the graduate students who are in person. We're going to do a talk back time, but for people online. I'm going to say something real quick because I have to run and teach a class. Um, but yes, like I, I think the important for, for the important thing for me to keep in mind is is the, the broader context. Like people use credit to to meet social needs and understanding it in that context is is really important. It, it's not just like folks are borrowing to make frivolous purchases or they don't know what they're doing. It's like there's a there's a broader policy context where folks have to use credit, have to use credit for pursuing higher education, for, for buying a house, for like a, a wide variety of things. Um, and because of that, there's like a, a it, it just creates all sorts of, of downstream consequences. Um, and so thinking of it in like that broader context, I think um, um, encourages uh, all sorts of policy approaches that can focus on, on meeting the sort of demand side. Like why do people use credit in the first place and what can we do to, to to make that not happen. Um, that's it. I guess going there, you yeah. started maybe. Um, mm -hmm. I I mean I just want to echo that that like but uh, but I guess take it one step further, which is I think when we think about policy and you know policy making, I I just um, I'm always trying to to at least fight for the big for the big change for the structural change um because then you end up with smaller things but i mean if you start with smaller things you're going to end up with even smaller things and you know what small things are complicated and they actually add to the to to things not working um so um i think you know we know that the problem is really that people need to use credit for subsistence and that's that's like you know we can't just ignore that and then try to fix the margins um you know i mean like i'm still trying to do that too but but, you know, the main focus really should be in, like, why are we doing, this is the wrong way, um, you know, to run a society. Um, and I'll just close with saying, when I was a legal aid attorney, one of the ways that we saw really, like, lasting success with folks who are sued on debt collection practices was to treat the issue holistically. So we actually partnered with the United Way Bay Area Spark Point Centers with Mission Economic Development um, Fund or Mission Asset Fund and Mission Economic Development Association to help introduce folks to things like community lending circles and alternative products. 
um, that were not predatory uh, or connecting them with community banks, particularly for like small business owners. So thinking of a debt collection lawsuit, not as sort of a standalone isolated incident, but thinking of it as as my as our colleagues have, have talked about today as sort of a reflection of a broader systemic issue. And when we think about that, either from the top down, as Dali is talking with the big change or from the bottom up with individual services by nonprofit or legal aid attorneys or courts themselves, right? Um, then we're really thinking about helping helping individuals get out of poverty. Um, and I think that I, I would ask courts to like step up and play a bigger role in this um, because courts uh, courts are are a public service and they should act as such. That's that's what I would say. And the final piece I want to just reiterate is, of course, as your data have shown, it's very racialized. So that's something we have to keep in mind is about the urgency of this um, for social equity purposes. Thank you so much. Two of you will stay on. We'll do our talk back. I uh, really want to thank the audience for joining us as well. And Raf, good luck teaching.